prayed, still late at night, still studying. Why? Because he's got a love for Almighty God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And he went into the tent. Hallelujah. I didn't get through that scripture. Speaking between, okay. And he, he went to speak with the Lord, and he heard a voice speaking to him from between the two cherubims. Above the atonement, covered on the ark of the testimony. And he spoke with them. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 4.12. The, then the Lord spoke to you out of the fire. You heard the sound of of words but saw no form there was only a voice has anybody here from a little girl or boy ever been in your home and you felt someone called you and you ran and you, you ran up to mom did you call no i didn't call i was at work you're at work good it's your boss no it wasn't oh it's not your boss <laughs> okay <laughs> somebody called me and then i heard my tune yeah. Oh, yeah. It sounded like my father's voice. And it wasn't. That's right. It's Almighty God. Yeah. It's the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I know God was calling me. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Not many people today have the privilege of hearing the Lord God of Israel speak to them in this and through this manner. Deuteronomy 4.36 And out of the heaven he made thee to hear his voice that he might instruct thee, and upon the earth he showed thee his great fire. And thou hearest his words out of the midst of the fire. And uh, I put something here, I'm not going to read, I don't feel I should. Just a, I, well, just a kind of little thing. Remember, whoever watched Braveheart, did anyone watch Braveheart here? Remember the Irishman was fighting, he says, I, hear, I heard the father's voice, he says, what did you hear? I'm going to get out of here safe, but you are not going to. <laughs> Putting it nicely and politely. Yeah. Hallelujah. We all hear, we all, we, we all can hear God audibly. This is what I'm talking about. God can speak audibly. Hallelujah. And I just want to take a few minutes and with this testimony. Before I share, I want to prepare the heart and ask God to clear your ear gate and ask him to speak to you again. Father, we bow before you in the name of Jesus. We ask that the Holy Spirit come to us, O oh God. We're not here to play church. We're not here to come after Sunday after Sunday and just and just get into the same old rut. Father, we ask, O oh God, that you open up our ear gate and you open up our eye gate that we can hear your voice clearly and know your direction for this church and for individuals in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. I'm going to call this, this testimony the darkest day of my life. The year was 1978, 31 years ago. I lost my dad at the young age of 46. Let me take a moment to introduce him to you. Although he's not here, but in the spirit. Physically, that would be impossible. But through the imagination, all things are possible. My, dad's, uh, was, uh, my dad was a man, was a man's man. If you know what that means. He was a man's man. He was involved in sports, and he was just a talented young man. And he had all the talent in the world, but he wasted it. He, he had so much talent, it was amazing. When he walked into a room, every eye took notice. His appearance was as Dean Martin. How many know Dean Martin? There's got to be Dean Martin over in here. So my dad was an image of Dean Martin. I mean, a spitting image. That was like... And he didn't like that because he just thinks he was a big drunk and a smoker and he, he, he didn't like that, you know. But that was his, that was the way he was. He had that look about him and uh, so just to give you an idea of what he looked like. And I said that to say that I never worshipped him but I adored him. He was my dad. He is, he is my dad still. When I get to heaven I'll still know that he was my dad anyway. Hallelujah. And he wasn't a, a Christian until two years before he passed away. No, he never came outright and stood up like we are here and came to church and said that he was what he was. But sometime early before, the two years before he passed away, the Holy Ghost was breaking through in his life. My dad was a humble man. It wasn't until the showing of his body and I was 18 years old, and I was looking at him in a coffin. It's a really weird feeling. We never said bye to my dad. He just left. 
And that's got to be the hardest thing for me, is he left. And this is why I got so hungry with God, and I heard him the way I heard him. Because I wrestled with God for seven days to find out some answers. And I don't want to go too far ahead because I want to repeat myself. But here I was looking at him in the box. And uh, I'll never forget it. I'm standing there looking at him and thinking, man, you're white. And all those things that go through your mind when you're looking at him. Of course, he's not there. Mm-hmm. And my uncle says, there's Curly Davis coming in. And Curly Davis says, who's that? He says, that's the guy that scouted your dad for the season of Indian. Hardball. That's what they used to say. If you guys don't know baseball, it's thing is Blue Davis. And I went, you're kidding. I lived 18 years with this man, and I never even knew that. That's a humble man. Everything I've heard about my dad, I heard I heard through other people. Never heard anything from himself. It's amazing. Thank you, Lord. The last words of my dad, the last words my dad ever said to me was, Gary, slow down, referring to the winter. It was winter was it was getting like ice out there. It was late August, uh, late October. It was a bad night. He said, If you slow down and put your seatbelt on, that was my dad telling me about this. He never did. My dad was from old school. He stopped kissing me at nine years old in case I turned out to be on the other side. Adam and Steve. And, <laughs> and I regret that today because I'm my little boy. I won't stop kissing his face till I don't care how until he's gone's age. I don't care if I live that old. I don't I don't I don't I don't care. No, that's not against you, Don. No, please. So, I mean, you know what I'm saying, brother. Peace. But uh but you know what I'm saying, church, is that you know that that's the way my dad was. That's, he was raised that way. So at nine years old, I had the I had the the unfortunate of not kissing my dad. Or you know, I remember when I was 12, I went to him. I went to kiss him by accident. It was just force of habit on the cheek. He was okay, right here. here. And he let me kiss him on the cheek, and then that was it. You know. So, uh, but what had happened was um, he had passed away. And now I'll be just maybe back up for that. When he would, I was 18 years old. I was only saved just a year, just a year. And I remember uh, coming up to coming up to in the morning. We ate breakfast, and we were four hours in the, in the room walking around. He was on the couch, and uh, he didn't have any blankets on. And his arm, his leg was up like this, and his arm was like this. And I went up to him, and I looked at I looked at him. And I'm going, I see it move. I see the stomach move, and I don't see it move. My mind played tricks with me. It was incredible. So then I, I went to the window because his head was right there. And I, and I didn't want him, if he, I didn't know he had passed away. I didn't know he was 11 and a half hours, eight and a half hours already dead, hard in his table. I didn't know that. I didn't touch him. But, so I'm getting close to him. I'm, I'm looking, and I said, and I'm looking at his eyes. I can see his hazel green eyes. Well, they're open, and I thought he was waking up, so I looked out the window. I didn't want him to think I was staring at him. <laughs> so here, here I am. I know. Here I am. You know, so then, I, again, it, your mind plays tricks on you, because my mind wanted to see that stomach move. I said, Mom, it doesn't look like Dad's breathing. You know, oh, he is. I take, I'm taking care of him. No problem. No problem. So instead of touching him and waking him up to ask him to go borrow his keys, I just took his car keys and and uh, uh, I just drove across Aurora. That's where I'm from. I got to my grandma's house. I just got to my grandma's house and the phone rang. And my mom says, Gary, come home. And I said, Is Dad okay? She said, well, Just come home with you, huh? I said, I said, um, Excuse me, church. But anyway, I said, I got in the car and I said, Lord, I know he's dead. It's real. I know he's dead. I said, prepare me for when I walk in the house and what I'm going to see. Prepare me. I knew I was walking into the, the darkest day of my life. But I got to tell you, I get excited. I cry when I get excited. When I know the darkest day of my life is, is raised up through Christ, hallelujah. And I walked up the stairs, I walked in the front door, and I walked up the stairs, and his body be over here. And a good friend tried to block us. They blocked me. And I said, is my dad dead? Is he, is he died? Just like that, because it was really, really not, my mind was going, he says, your dad's gone. And I turned, and I went to my room, and I threw myself on the bed, and I yelled my head off. I yelled, I yelled, I went, oh, God, and I yelled, I let everything out. Honestly, I think 30 minutes went by, and a blanket was already over his head. And the doctor had already come by the time I was crying in my room. He had already come and would not take his body away because he had pills by him, and um, they would not do that because the coroner has to come and take him away. And, uh, so I got on my knees. This is, this is, the, this is it. I got on my knees. And it was over a period of five years that God showed me what was going on. God, I, I sought God. 
but within the seven days from the, the time we buried him to the time I heard God audibly.